Hello everyone. In this lecture, I'll be covering the P53 protein and its associated pathways. I will end the presentation talking about this recent article by Simon et al. titled Converging Mechanisms of P53 Activation Drive Motor, Motor Neuron Degeneration in Spinal Muscular Atrophy, published in the Journal of Cell Reports. So I hope you enjoy. So P53 P53 is a highly evolutionarily conserved and critically important uh, tumor suppressor gene, a TSG. And homologs of P53, P53 can be traced essentially back billions of years to the origin of multicellular life. And it's, it's, just, it's found across all walks of life. Mutations in P53 are found in 50% of all cancers, which is just a remarkable um, number and it's the single most mutated gene in all of cancer. And because of this, P53 is the single most studied gene in all of biology, perhaps because of this fact that is involved in so many different cancers. So what does P53 actually do? Well, P53 generally functions as a stress activated transcription factor that promotes apoptotic cell death. However, P53 is also involved in regulating DNA repair signaling, uh, entrance into the into uh, cell, cellular senescence, uh, cell cycle blockades, and metabolism. So although P53 is generally thought of as inducing cell death as a response to uh, carcinogenesis, it's, uh, it has also taken on many other uh, additional functions. What's probably most amazing about P53 is just how important this single gene is. Um, it, it would, it, it's a wonder of biology that cells have placed so much importance into this single gene. Because this single gene, uh, it's so important for preventing cancer that a single mutation can, uh, can, can allow a cell to completely avoid apoptosis because they've lost this single gene. Uh, in terms of where P53 is found, P53 is localized to the nucleoplasm, but it's also found in the cytoplasm, and we'll discuss that. Uh, it's, it's minimally expressed during basal conditions, um, but it's upregulated during cancer or um, even neurodegenerative disease progression. So during normal business as usual activity, P53 is continuously degraded, and during apoptotic cell death, P53 spikes. And paradoxically, P53 is typically upregulated up -regulated during cancer. And the reason for this is, is because P53 doesn't, or is not able to induce cell death because it's been mutated in such a way that it no longer binds DNA and no longer promotes apoptosis. The stress-induced activation of P53 involves the formation of a, of a stable and transcriptionally active tetramer. So in order for P53 to bind DNA, it actually has to associate with three other P53 proteins. So there's four in total. And this tetramer forms a, a functional DNA binding domain. In cancer, this poses a really unfortunate problem because it means that heterozygotic mutations, meaning just one copy gets mutated, can prevent the wild type copy from functioning. Because the wild type copy, if it associates with a mutated copy, it's not able to bind DNA often, depending on the mutation, but that's typically what's happening. So anyways, let's uh, move into some specific pathways and discuss what P53 actually does. Okay, so to begin, let's just start with our DNA. So this will be our, our DNA. We'll have a P53 protein out here. And P53, when it's active, it on, even under basal conditions, it leads to the upregulation of this protein called HDM2, which uh, stands for human double minute two. It was originally discovered in mice and it was called um, MDM2, so MDM2, HDM2, 
are typically are kind of the, the same thing. And HDM2 in complex with uh, MDMX, it's another protein that is typically found associated with HDM2. These two proteins uh, function as a, a ubiquitin ligase, ligase, an E3 ubiquitin ligase. What they can do is that they target P53 and they, they poly ubiquitinate. So this is a poly ubiquitin chain. And this poly ubiquitination, poly ubiquitination uh, leads to P53's degradation in the proteasome. So degradation. So P53's own its own transcriptional activity actually leads to its demise by upregulating HDM2 and uh, MDMX. What's interesting, and this is how P53 gains a cytoplasmic um, presence, is that under certain conditions, it's not really understood exactly how, but monoubiquitination, as depicted right here, monoubiquitination actually leads to the export. So let's say this is the nuclear membrane, this is the nucleus. It actually leads to the export of P53 into the cytosol. It's, um, they're not, it's not necessarily understood why sometimes it's polyubiquitination and sometimes HDM2 leads to monoubiquitination, but it, it could be the influence of um, deubiquitinases that maybe favor the monoubiquitination. But regardless, when P53 is monoubiquitinated, it's exported into the cytosol and it can actually trigger the formation of what's called a, a MOP, a mitochondrial outer membrane pore. So right up here in the corner, you see your mitochondria and P53 can travel to the mitochondria where it binds to a bunch of different proteins, including um, BAC, BAX, uh, BCL2. It binds all these different proteins and it does it in what's called a kiss and run. It'll bind to them, but it doesn't. It only does so transiently. And this, in some way, leads to the, the oligomerization of BAX and BAD, which we won't, or BAX and BAC, which leads to the release of cytochrome C. I'm not going to get too much into that because this is kind of a, an extra pathway of P53. It's not the primary pathway. But this um, DNA independent mechanism of cell death is, is, is important. And it was originally discovered because P53 upregulation in cells that are lacking a nucleus uh, actually caused apoptosis. So P53 can cause apoptosis even when there's no DNA. P53 can also induce apoptosis when there's no translation. If they inhibit translation with a certain inhibitor, um, I think it was cyclohexamide, the, the cells can still enter apoptosis. So even though P53 is uh, not leading, it's not the, these, this transcription may not be leading to uh, protein products, it, P53 can still cause apoptosis. So it, there, there's a mechanism of cell death independent of DNA, but for our purposes, what's important is that this, this P53 can cause the, the, a, a high level of HDM2 to be uh, translated, and HDM2 polyubiquitinates P53 leading to its degradation. Okay, so quickly, just to summarize, we have HDM2. HDM2 is typically is the main ubiquitin ligase that targets P53. We also have MDMX, which, which um, is found in complex with HDM2, but can, it can also directly bind P53 and, and inhibit it. But either way, these two proteins are inhibiting P53. So we haven't talked about necessarily how P53, how 50, P, how P53 leads to apoptosis in the nucleus. So it can enter the cytoplasm and cause the formation of a MOMP, 
or it can act on DNA by forming a tetramer, right? It forms a tetramer that's, that's four subunits. And the formation of this tetramer leads to the upregulation of a couple of very nasty proteins. So uh, Noxa, Puma, um, BAC, and BAX, and many others. Um, if P53 becomes trans transcriptionally active, it can lead to the upregulation of these proteins that lead to apoptosis. So these, these, these proteins are uh, going to bind to BCL2-like proteins and cause the opening of a, a MOMP. One of the main ways in which P53 is regulated, this is where we are going to start getting into regulation. So imagine this is DNA. Over here, we have another DNA strand. So we talked about how DNA damage, we, we know DNA damage can cause uh, apoptosis. And this is actually how that happens. We have some kind of break in our DNA, right? And the first respond, responders to DNA damage, one of the first responders, is either uh, MRN, the MRN complex, or uh, the Q, Q70 complex. Uh, it depends on the type of break. It depends on type of cell and you know, many other things. But it's usually the MRN or the Q70. The, the MRN complex stands for, it's actually uh, three different proteins. It's the um, MRE11, uh, RAD50, and uh, NBS1. That's actually three proteins in the MRN complex. But anyways, so there's DNA damage. MR, MRN or Q70 recognizes and binds to that DNA damage, and they somehow recruit and activate these other guys. This is going to be uh, ATM, and this guy is going to be ATR. ATM and ATR, they're named after uh, neurological diseases that are caused when they're mutated, when they're uh, non-functional. But uh, when ATM binds to MRN, MRN at the um, at the DNA, a broken uh, mutated DNA, sorry, not mutated, binds to this double-stranded break, it somehow activates ATM and ATR, although the mechanism isn't understood, it does activate them. And ATM is a kinase, ATM is a kinase that will then phosphorylate uh, CHK2, uh, phosphorylate CHK2. And ATR does something very similar. It phosphorylates uh, CHK1. So we have the phosphorylation and the activation of CHK2 and CHK1. And these are kinases that are more mobile, and they will then kind of work together. They, they kind of have similar phosphorylation targets, as you can tell by their name. They phosphorylate both P53 and HDM2. I should probably use the inhibitory sign because when it phosphorylates HDM2, it inhibits it. So CHK2 and CHK1 inhibit HDM2 and MDMX. And that releases this break on P53. And not only that, but they also directly phosphorylate P53 and they activate P53 through this phosphorylation. So DNA damage is it can is primarily leads to cell death through P53, and it does that through uh, MRN uh, activating ATM or ATR, which then phosphorylates and activates CHK2 and CHK1, which then turn off HDM2 and they turn on P53. When P53 is turned on, it upregulates these BH3 pro-apoptotic proteins. Okay, so we learned in the last slide how HDM2 and MD, MDMX are the primary regulators of P53. And they do this through kind of a negative regulation, right? Because they 
they are the, the brakes of P53. And what they do is they inhibit P53 and they prevent P53 from uh, making puma or you know, vax or something. So the primary mechanism of P53 regulation actually involves inhibiting HDM2 or MDMX. And that indirectly leads to the activation of P53 by relieving the brakes. One of the most important inhibitors of HDM2 and MDMX besides uh, ATM or CHK1 and 2 is ARF, A-R-F. It it's, stands for Alternative Reading Frame, and it's the alternative reading frame of P14. P14 is a protein involved in the cell cycle, and ARF can be transcribed or transcribed under certain conditions, and when ARF is upregulated, it's the primary uh, inhibitor of HTM2. It binds HTM2 and inhibits its polyubiquitination of P53. Another class of protein that does the same thing are the ribo, uh, ribonuclear proteins. And the and these ribonuclear proteins can actually be released during uh, during stress. So the ribonuclear proteins are found, uh, commonly found in the nucleolus. That's where they're located. And they're called RLP proteins, like RLP1, RLP20. There's like 50 different RLP proteins, so I'll just write RLP for them. And the reason these proteins are interesting is because during, during times of stress, during stressful cellular conditions, the nucleolus actually dissolves and it releases all these RLP proteins. And many of these RLP proteins uh, basically do the same thing as ARF. In fact, ARF is actually a ribonuclear protein. And when they're released from the nucleolus, they all, or not all, but about five or six of them have been shown to bind and inhibit HDM2. So the dissolution of the nucleolus can lead to the inhibition of HDM2 and the upregulation of P53. Now the question is, what causes the nucleolus to dissolve? What causes it to lose its integrity? Well, this actually goes back to DNA. And in fact, it goes back to a polymerase, RNA polymerase 1. Polymerase. RNA polymerase 1 is not the same polymerase that makes mRNA. mRNA is made by RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 1 makes the rRNA that goes into the production of ribonuclear proteins, ribosomes. It's the, the major components of the RLP proteins. And the in order for RNA polymerase 1 to function correctly, it needs a very important transcription factor called TIF1-alpha. TIF1-A, TIF1-alpha. It's an RNA polymerase 1 transcription factor. And what studies have shown is that when TIF1 is inhibited, it leads to the loss of rRNA production, and the loss of rRNA leads to the dissolution of the nucleolus and the inhibition of HDM2. The question is what inhibits RNA polymerase 1? Goes back to a couple of kinases that you may recognize. Uh, J and K, AMPK for AMP dependent kinase, and mTORC. Um, there's a couple of others, I'm not going to get into them, but there's a couple of different kinases that are known to phosphorylate and inhibit TIF1. They cause TIF1 to dissociate from MR, uh, the RNA polymerase 1. And again, the when TIF1 dissociates from RNA polymerase 1, it, it causes our, all these RLP proteins to lose their integrity. You know, I think of it as if they don't have anything, if they don't have any rRNA, they don't have anything to do, and they decide, decide to go off and do other things in the nucleoplasm. And when they dissolve into the nucleoplasm, they like to inhibit HDM2. And so this is an interesting mechanism by which uh, various kinases can 
lead to the activation of P53. Uh, just a really quick correction. mTORC actually uh, activates TIF1 and rRNA production. Only J and K and AMPK inhibit TIF1. So instead of including mTORC, we can say the loss of mTORC inactivates TIF1. Another important player that I forgot to mention is CERT1. CERT1 is the NAD-dependent deacetylase that can inhibit TIF1 as well by deacetylating it. So you might notice that JNK, AMPK, and CERT1 are all uh, stress-activated kinases. Uh, AMPK1, their AMPK and CERT1 are both activated during starvation. So perhaps prolonged uh, starvation or JNK signaling can lead to the uh, loss of rRNA and the dissolution of the nucleolus and the stabilization of P53. Okay, so converging mechanisms of P53 activation drive motor neuron degeneration in SMA. So SMA, or spinal muscular, muscular atrophy, is a incredibly debilitating disease that is the most common genetic cause of infant mortality. So SMA is caused by, SMA is caused by a genetic mutation that prevents the proper splicing of the SMN1 protein, leading to SMN1 deficiency in all the tissues. So the mutations observed in this disease prevent the proper recognition of the SMN1 pre-mRNA by uh, splicing machinery. And ultimately this prevents the transcript from being uh, translated. Uh, the loss of SMN1, despite being absent from all tissue, leads to, to the degeneration of, a, uh, of specific subpopulations of motor neurons in the spinal cord. So for some reason um, that's not currently known, SMN1 appears to be specifically important to very particular subpopulations of motor neurons in the spinal cord. So not even all motor neurons in the spinal cord, just a, a couple of subpopulations within the spinal cord. In the current paper uh, by Simon et al., the researchers sought to discover patterns of gene expression that predict or explain this differential neuron uh, vulnerability. In other words, what can gene expression tell us about why uh, medial motor neurons die and lateral motor neurons survive? What, is, what explains that discrepancy? And this is what they discovered. First, uh, they found that P53 expression and activation correlates with vulnerable neuro neuronal populations, but not the resistant neuronal populations. So many of the genes they found to be upregulated were known products of P53 mediated transcription. They were downstream of P53. And this only occurred in cell populations that are known to die very early in SMA and not so much in populations that are relatively resistant. Closer examination revealed that N-terminal P53 phosphorylation is a death marker of SMN1 deficient neurons. So although P53 uh, did eventually spike in some of the resistant neurons in the late stages of disease, the P53 was generally not phosphorylated and it appears that P53 expression and activation by phosphorylation were, were the critical markers that predicted uh, neurons that were uh, vulnerable. So ultimately, P53 expression and P53 phosphorylation were uh, death markers of vulnerable neurons. Let's see if I can depict a what this paper is kind of discussing. So this is my horrible drawing of a spinal cord column. And what, they're, what this paper is discussing is that basically in the medial portion of the spinal column, you get these events happening. You get uh, SS, SMN1 uh, deficiency. So SM1 is lost because of a splicing error. And this leads to uh, P53 
accumulation. P53 is upregulated. And what's interesting is that P53 appears to be phosphorylated in these more vulnerable uh, medial um, cells. And this, lead, this is a marker of cell death, leads to cell death. And so that what, what's critical is that this, this phosphorylation event occurs and they, they really wanted to find what kinase mediates this. They looked at J and K signaling and they also looked at uh, DNA damage because they figured maybe DNA damage or J and K led to this N-terminal phosphorylation event that was a marker of cell death. However, they weren't. Neither, neither J and K or DNA damage when, uh, when inhibited prevented the phosphorylation of P53. It still happened. So they don't know why P53 or the kinase that was phosphorylating P53. This is all in contrast to what's happening down here uh, in the, the lateral sections of the spinal column. In these lateral uh, neurons, you st you, they, they still see a loss of SMN1. SMN1 is still decreased. And in the later stages of the later stages of disease, you they they are still seeing uh, p53 upregulation. However, it's not being phosphorylated. It's just p53. And these are the resistant neurons. So the critical event is the phosphorylation of p53 that distinguishes the vulnerable neurons from the resistant neurons that do not have phosphorylated P53.